Hi everyone, my name is Jolie McCrary and this video is part three of the unit one series, Biological Basis of Behavior for AP Psychology students. This video will cover chemical messengers and the nervous system. So this video will finish up the topic of the neuron and neural firing. In the previous video, part two, you went through an in-depth explanation of the electrical part of the neural transmission process. Today's video will focus specifically on the chemical component. So after completing today's video, you should be able to answer these two key focus questions. You will also be able to define these essential concepts that are related to chemical messengers. So before I talk about the functions of each neurotransmitter, I want to do a quick review of the content that was covered in video part two. So you can just have that basic review of the neural communication right there in the forefront of your mind. So first you learned that our brain and body communicate through the nervous system, which is a network of nerves that sends messages almost instantaneously through the electrochemical process. You might also also remember that I focused pretty heavily on the parts of the nervous system, the parts of the neuron, and then how the electrical impulse works. So today I'll focus on the neurotransmitters, which are those tiny chemicals that cross those gaps called synapses. And every neurotransmitter communicates a very specific message and it leaves the axon terminal crossing the synapse, binding at the receptor sites with uh, the neighboring neuron, and humans have over a hundred different neurotransmitters in their nervous system. In AP Psychology, you only need to know eight of them. Some neurotransmitters are inhibitory, which means they decrease the likelihood that a neuron will fire an action potential, which effectively calms and slows the neural activity. Excitatory neurotransmitters are those that increase the likelihood that a neuron will fire an action potential and promote um, like the speeding up of neural activity. So now let me talk about the specific neurotransmitters you need to know as AP Psychology students. You'll need to be able to describe each of their functions as well as what happens if there is an excess or if there is not enough of that particular neurotransmitter. The first is called GABA, which stands for the gamma aminobutraic acid, and it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter in the nervous system. So that means that it helps reduce neural activity and promotes a calmness. GABA slows the nervous system and prevents the over excitation of neurons and helps regulate anxiety and stress and just overall brain activity. Too much GABA can lead to excessive drowsiness or sedation and having too little GABA can result in anxiety, restlessness, insomnia, or even conditions like uh, tremors or seizures when the neurons can become overly excited. Glutamate, on the other hand, is an excitatory neurotransmitter in the nervous system, so it helps to increase neural activity, and it is crucial in the cognitive processes of learning and memory. Too much glutamate in the brain and nervous system can cause overstimulation, potentially leading to headaches or even migraines. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that stimulates muscle contraction by transmitting signals from motor neurons to muscles, and it plays a role also in things like memory, arousal, and attention. But because some neurotransmitters have overlapping functions, I typically tell students to focus on glutamate for its role in learning and memory and acetylcholine for its role in muscle contraction. When there is too much acetylcholine in the brain and nervous system, people can experience muscle spasms, and when acetylcholine is lacking, people can experience muscle weakness. There are also significant memory issues related to deficiency in acetylcholine, most notably Alzheimer's disease. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that serves several functions. You might be most familiar with its role in the experience of pleasure and enjoyment. However, dopamine is also responsible for things like movement, learning, and attention. But as I previously mentioned, neurotransmitters can have some overlap in the messages that they communicate. So I usually tell students to remember dopamine for its function in the brain's 
reward system and experiencing pleasure. An oversupply of dopamine is linked to schizophrenia and an undersupply of dopamine is linked to the decreased mobility experienced in Parkinson's disease. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter most notably responsible for the regulation of mood, as well as other functions like hunger, sleep, learning, and memory. But I usually encourage students to remember the role that serotonin has in mood regulations because low serotonin levels are associated with depression and some medications related to raising serotonin levels are used to treat depression. But a lack of serotonin can also lead to appetite changes and sleep disruption. Norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter that plays a crucial role in the sympathetic nervous system, which you learned in video part two, is responsible for increasing the body's functioning in related to stressful situations, um, things you might refer to as the fight or flight response. So specifically, the neurotransmitter norepinephrine is responsible for the increased alertness and cognitive functioning needed for those stressful situations, things like increased heart rate increased blood flow to the muscles and alertness and focus. Too much norepinephrine could lead to increased anxiety and too little could lead to depressed moods, fatigue, or lack of focus. Endorphins are neurotransmitters that are released into the nervous system as a response to pain. Some people refer to them as the body's natural painkiller because they influence our perception of pain. They can replace the pain with a neutral feeling or even a sense of pleasure. Think of it like experiencing a runner's high. Or maybe you've heard of a situation where someone was in a terrible accident. Maybe they were badly injured yet they were able to escape the situation without feeling any pain. Only minutes later do they feel the onset of the pain. This is the function of the endorphin to block the perception of pain and possibly even replace it with neutral or even positive feelings. There's not much as far as malfunctions when it comes to endorphins, but possibly an oversupply of endorphins could potentially cause a person to maybe endure an injury for too long, maybe causing them not to get the medical attention as soon as they should, maybe causing unnecessary damage. But students should know that pain-killing drugs like opioids mimic the body's endorphins and the overuse of opiates can cause the body to suppress its natural endorphin supply. The neurotransmitter substance P is similar to endorphins because substance P is also related to pain. We just learned that endorphins can temporarily block pain and give a sense of relief whereas substance P is a message that alerts the brain that the body is in pain. So substance P transmits pain signals from the body to the brain, and it's related to the body's inflammation and re immune responses. An oversupply of substance P can be associated with chronic pain. So far, we focused on the body's nervous system as the communication system between the brain and body, but there's another system that communicates in the body and it's called the endocrine system. And the endocrine system is not nearly as fast as the nervous system, but its effects can last longer in the body. The endocrine system is coordinated by the hypothalamus in junction with the pituitary gland, and they coordinate to release hormones into the bloodstream. Now, like neurotransmitters in the nervous system, hormones in the bloodstream communicate specific messages to the body as well. Notice the blue box at the top of the screen. Students need to know the functions of five hormones, but not necessarily the glands or the functions of the entire endocrine system. So over the remaining slides, I'll briefly touch on the role of these five hormones. They are outside of the nervous system, but they are chemicals produced by glands in the endocrine system, released in the bloodstream, and also play a role in communicating messages to the body. So just a few minutes ago, you learned that in a fight or flight situation, norepinephrine is released in the synapses of the nervous system, quickly increasing heart rate and other body functions. Simultaneously, the hormone adrenaline is released into the bloodstream from the adrenal glands. Unlike the neurotransmitter norepinephrine, 
adrenaline's release is slower, but it sustains its effects longer, allowing the body to maintain that heightened sense of readiness even after the immediate threat has passed. Ghrelin and leptin are hormones that are related to hunger and appetite. Ghrelin is known as the hunger hormone because it stimulates our appetite. It promotes us to take in food. It's primarily produced in the stomach and it's released into the bloodstream and ghrelin levels rise before meals. It makes us hungry and they decrease after eating. Leptin is a, an appetite suppressant. Basically what it does is when we have enough energy stored in fat cells, it signals to the body that we have enough energy and we have enough. A high levels of leptin decrease our appetite and cause us to increase our energy expenditure. Melatonin is a hormone that's released into the bloodstream and it regulates our sleep and wake cycles. It, the, these cycles are called the circadian rhythm and we'll learn more about that at the end of our unit one. But melatonin promotes sleep. Its production is influenced by light and dark cycles and typically levels of melatonin increase in the evening making us feel more sleepy and decrease in the morning as daylight returns and make us feel more wakeful. Oxytocin is often called the love hormone or the bonding hormone because of its role in social bonding and emotional attachment. It's produced by the hypothalamus and released into the bloodstream by the pituitary gland. Oxytocin plays a key role in um, the bonding between mother and infant during childbirth and during breastfeeding, as well as forming attachments between romantic partners and social interactions. To close out this video, let's do a few short review questions. Remember, as we've done in previous videos, I'll read the question out loud, but you'll need to pause the video to determine the answer. I'll include the correct answers on the last slide of this video. Question number one says, imagine you are the teacher of an AP psychology course and one of your students declares, hormones are the same thing as neurotransmitters. Which statement best modifies their claim to make it more accurate? Question number two says, Axel jumped from his bed feeling a sense of alertness and fear. His heart raced and he scanned the room. Which neurotransmitter has likely impacted his alertness in this moment? Question number three says, Leah has been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Which of the following neurotransmitters most likely contributed to this disorder? This concludes part three, the chemical messengers of unit one, biological basis of behavior. You can check the multiple choice answers at the bottom of the screen. You should also be able to see that you can answer the key questions on the right hand side, as well as defining the essential concepts from this video.